Good. Thank you all for coming. Um, myself, Shaowei, Chichang, Donkrid, Justin, and Vitalik, who is apparently on this floor, uh, will today give you a, a deep dive into the phase zero specification. That is the beacon chain of the Ethereum 2.0 protocol. Um, today we will get as technical as we can with the time permitting, and at the same time point you to portions of the spec so you can dive in deeper um, and hopefully just get you more acquainted with uh, what's going on so that you can better technically understand the problems at hand and the solutions um, and can dig in and contribute, uh, all that. So, uh, we're building this thing, that's Ethereum 2, it's a sharded protocol. There are many shards connected to a central beacon chain. Um, it also is has a loose coupling to the uh, existing Ethereum chain, uh, which at the beginning just supports deposits coming into the beacon chain. Uh, today, phase zero is just this pure proof of stake chain connected to the Ethereum 1 protocol. Um, so that is uh, what we'll talk about today. I believe at the same time, we'll at least show you the scaffolding upon which shard chains will be connected, uh, but we will not dive deep into this portion of the protocol. The beginning, what we're gonna start off with today is uh, we're gonna look at kind of the, some of the core building blocks of consensus. That's uh, the Casper FFG protocol, uh, the LMD ghost fork choice, randomness, and uh, BLS signatures. Uh, after that, we'll take a short break, maybe take some questions, and then we'll dive into the actual, um, some of the mechanics and instanti concrete uh, instantiation of the protocol. Um, the, the actual state transition and things, and validators and things built on top of some of these components. So, um, FFG applied to proof of stake. So there was a paper written probably about a year and a half ago now by Vitalik and Virgil Griffith, um, Casper FFG uh, consensus protocol generally built to be layered upon um, a block proposal mechanism, the original being a proof of work mechanism, uh, but there's some modifications to bring this protocol to be on top of a proof of stake protocol and more importantly some modifications that get us to where we need to go for this protocol. So I'm gonna go over some of <sighs> Some of, some of those modifications, how we think about slots, checkpoints, epochs, um, slashing, finality, that kind of stuff. Um, I will give you an intuition for the safety proof, um, but we'll not have time to dig deep into that. Um, and we have a, yeah, I'll talk, I'll talk like that. <laughs> um, now I can hear myself. Uh, we will, we have a, um, Modification of the FFG protocol in a paper. It is a draft. I really wish it was gonna be done by today. It's in the last round of edits and will be released on archive very soon. So hopefully this will help you read that paper when it comes out. So <clears throat> traditionally when we think about uh, blockchain protocols, um, we think about blocks and block heights. And every block you build on top of another block moves us into another block height. The original FFG protocol uh, considered um, consider block heights and actions that validators could take with respect to block heights. Um, these heights were divided into um, epochs uh, and, and units of work would be done per epoch. So essentially a round of voting by all validators can happen per epoch. What you can do and not do to the protocol is also kind of defined within these epochs. Uh, we have a slight modification to how we think about a chain being built. Still, we have blocks linked to each other, block by block, building a blockchain. But we have this notion of, of time called a slot, also embedded into this, kind of overlaid on this structure. And so, <laughs> what we can, uh, <laughs> what can or cannot be done by a, by a validator at any given time is with respect to a slot. So my duty to propose or to attest or do any type of these messages is with respect to a slot. And so a block, uh, someone, someone shows up and they propose this at slot zero, this at slot one. No one showed up at slot two or maybe it didn't get propagated to the network. And so the proposer at slot three built upon slot two. But the, the state transition, the internal mechanics of the consensus protocol and other portions of the protocol are aware of this skip. And so instead of things being divided into strictly block heights, because this would just be a block height of three, although 
much more has transpired with respect to the, the duties and, and positions of the protocol. So instead, um, epochs are divided into slots. Slots, uh, epochs in, in, in actuality are on the order of like 64 slots. This is just illustrative. Um, so this consensus protocol needs to be uh, modified, FFG needs to be modified to work on top of uh, this new kind of slot and epoch mechanism. Um, checkpoints. So in Casper FFG, we checkpoint, we attempt to finalize checkpoints. Checkpoints are uh, blocks at uh, per units of time. Um, here, checkpoint might be this block, whereas there might be might that. Um, but importantly, because we have this notion of skipped slots, uh, we have to define what actually a block being at a checkpoint is and means. And so we call it, um, in, the, in this paper coming out, it's called an epic boundary block, EBB. Um, so in this fork of the chain, we have the epic boundary block, which is the zeroth block in that epic, is actually B. But in this fork of the chain, where a slot at slot 66 was built on top of uh, A, the epic boundary block is actually, it's the block at the zeroth slot or the most immediate block prior. So it's actually, it's actually A. So in this version of the chain, uh, this fork of the chain, if, if votes are happening and blocks are justified, if something was, was checkpointed or finalized, um, it would actually be A at this slot. Because A can be transitioned through empty slots up until B exists. You're actually um, checkpointing and ultimately finalizing this tuple of A at the start of this slot. Uh, to illustrate that a little bit more, what I was implying is we have this notion of paired justification and paired finality. In the optimal case, we're always just, say, justifying the, the zero. Uh, in the optimal case, we're always justifying and finalizing if all the blocks exist at all slots, then we can just always justify the zeroth one here. But instead, because we, we can have drop slots and skip slots, we have to have a notion of what we're actually, at a given epoch, what we're actually finalizing. And, and, it, and it turns out that we're, we're finalizing this notion of a paired justification of a block at an epoch. So just to illustrate that a little bit more, um, we have a block at epoch one, the zeroth slot at 64. Um, but then uh, nothing happens. Like some, everyone goes offline or some massive forking happens. And the proposer, the next proposer, actually in epoch two at slot 129, builds on top of this 64. And so, <clears throat> and we go on in this epoch two to actually justify um, this epoch boundary, which ended up being a block from a prior epoch, but at this slot. And so then we can go on to do further justifications and actually finalize this. And so what that does is finality in this mechanism ends up being um, not only will this block, say this block is at this epoch is finalized, not only will this block never revert, but blocks that are lower than this epoch boundary slot can also, built upon this, can also, uh, are also not valid. So for example, if someone built uh, a block right here at slot 65, 66, um, but this was finalized, those are, those are considered invalid and I don't consider them a part of my fork choice. So we have this, this notion uh, of coupling blocks with an epoch in finality. So <clears throat> justification rules. Um, similarly to Casper FFG, the original protocol, uh, the genesis block um, at epoch zero is justified. And subsequently, we have justified, again, we have these pairs, these block epoch pairs. Um, any uh, justification pair from a source of a prior justification pair is justified. Um, and when votes are cast, uh, we're always specifying a source and a target. So here in this link that was created, this prior justification uh, was the source and this new one is the target. So we create a justified link, I think it's called a super majority link, um, to create these just, this chain of justified blocks and a subset of them, depending on the rules, can be finalized. Um, 
So finality rules, I know this isn't actually super meaningful. This is taken from the paper. Um, <clears throat> the finality rules in the original Casper FFG paper were essentially you had to have two epochs that were sequentially justified, where the, uh, the lower of those two becomes finalized. Here, we actually extend the finality rules uh, to be a little bit, include a little bit more cases, where we, we generalize it. The original case that I just described is called the k equals one case, where we are sequentially justifying. But we can we can generalize this and, and add cases to the k equals n, such that the rule becomes: if we have a a justification link, and or here's our justification link, but all uh, epochs contained within that justification link are also justified, then we can finalize the source of this link. So here we jump to, but we justified the center, so we can finalize here. Here, we jump over, over uh, three, but we had justifications in the center, and so we can finalize the base. And the intuition here is that <clears throat> here, uh, our justification and finality here, is we can't double vote to try to uh, finalize something exactly. And if we wanted to um, essentially like skirt the double vote and, and jump over, then we, we, we can't, uh, there's an, and I'll get to that in a moment, we can't uh, surround this vote to essentially jump over. And here, we've like plugged the holes. So we have a similar mechanism and we've plugged the hole and then now we just need to prevent surrounds to uh, avoid that finality issue. Um, in the actual e, uh, Ethereum 2 protocol, we only consider the k up to k equals 2 case um, because, and the reason that we need this is because we allow attestations to be included um, during the epoch that they're created on chain um, up through the next epoch. And so you have a few, um, if things are not performing super optimally and attestations aren't being included on each epoch every time, um, and they're, they're included a little bit delayed, the, the state of the chain and what is actually justified in the view on chain can be delayed. Um, and so we have these cases where if we open up, here's our k equals one cases, uh, case two and case four, those are nice. Uh, but here we have these other k equals uh, two cases where by extending the finality rules, we actually can capture finality in a few more cases. Um, I think Justin will probably get into this a little bit later, but in the beacon state, we do have, um, these are the portions of the state that are related to finality. We track uh, the last four just epochs, whether we justified them, um, and a few things about the checkpoints, and with that data, we can um, track these cases and uh, no finality on the case of on-chain. Uh, here's this massive nasty function um, that processes uh, justifications and also processes finality uh, based upon those mechanisms. Um, I was kind of alluding to these and I probably should have had these earlier in the slides, uh, but we, <clears throat> the things that keep this protocol safe is we prevent uh, making double attestations, so voting for the same target in the, uh, in, within one epoch. Um, and we, as I alluded, uh, said earlier, we, we want to prevent, given any uh, source target link, here, 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 we, to, to prevent um, essentially getting around the no double vote, uh, we, we prevent a, a no surround, so I can't come from something earlier, jump over, and then begin finalizing. Uh, here's the actual code. Um, we can probably get into this a little bit later, where we take attestation data, uh, can't have the same target epoch, can't surround. That's that for now. Sorry that was so fast. Uh, we have a lot to cover today, and that's like one of the more detailed components. Uh, Vitalik? <laughs> All right, so I am going to be talking about, as you can guess, the um, LMD ghost fork choice rule. Um, so, okay, where's the, I guess, um, so to start off, kind of what is LMD ghost? Um, it's an adaptation of ghost, um, aka 
greedy, heaviest observed subtree, which is a uh, alternative uh, proof of work fork choice rule that some uh, academics, uh, Yonatan Sampolinsky and Aviv Zahar, developed uh, in 2014. And it basically takes the same principles as original ghost and tries to kind of modify them slightly and fit them into a uh, proof of stake uh, context. So to start, I'll uh, just a kind of quick intro of what ghost itself is. Basically, the idea here is that if you imagine a network where there is a lot of network latency, or there's normal network latency, network latency, but blocks are very fast. So say network latency is one second, you have a block coming every three seconds, then maybe like something like a quarter of all the blocks are, are not going to be kind of conveniently in the same chain, right? Because you might just have a block get produced and before that block gets broadcasted, another block gets created at, at the same time. And the reason why like this is bad and so in Bitcoin, they call this orphans or stales. In Ethereum, we call it uncles. Uh, the reason why it's bad is because if you uh, imagine there's an attacker, um, and the attacker is trying to do a 51% attack, so make an attack chain that's uh, longer than the honest chain after some point, then the attacker has an advantage, right? Because the fork choice set is, tries to look for the longest chain. So the honest chain, one out of every four blocks, is not lengthening the chain. It's kind of a sister of some other block. But on the attack chain, it's just the attacker, and so everything works perfectly. So instead of needing to have 51% of the hash power, the attacker might only need to have 43% of the hash power. And if network latency goes higher, then the percentage drops more and more. And as network latency approaches infinity, the attacker can do a 51% attack with basically nothing. So Ghost fixes this. And the kind of philosophy behind this, right, is that if you imagine a chain here where, let's say, block D um, was built on top of block B, but then this chain with block C and then block E ended up winning, if you look at block D, like, block D ultimately is still a vote for B, right? It may not be a part of correctly on the same chain, but D is still voting for B. Whoever voted, for, whoever built D still thought that B is a good block to build a chain on. And so, really, you should be taking into account both D and E as uh, of blocks that, su that support B's rightful position as, uh, as part of the chain. So, the way that Ghost works is basically, instead of looking at the longest chain, you, have the, you run this kind of iterative process where you start from the root. Um, if some block only has one child, you walk over to the child. Um, if, you, if a block has multiple children, then you select the child um, whose tree of descendants is larger, right? So over here, this block has no descendants, so a total of one including itself. Over here, this block has one, two, three, four, five, six descendants. And so you go over here, then you walk over here, then you have another fork, then this is the kind of heaviest subtree again, and so E is the head. Now, in this particular case, right, like the, the longest chain rule and ghost agree, but there are going to be plenty, like, many theoretical cases, especially when there's an active attack being attempted, when these extra blocks like, really do matter and they can save you from an attack. Now, the way that Ghost um, applies this to a proof of stake context is basically, to start off, it's very similar, except instead of looking at all blocks, it only looks at the block that is the most recent uh, message sub uh, submitted by that validator. So for example, in this case, imagine you have a proof of stake chain, you have five validators, we'll call them uh, like Alice, Bob, Charlie, David, and Evan. And if you look at Alice, Alice created two blocks, one over here and then one over here. And uh, Bob over here created this and this, Charlie created these two, David created this one, but then David might have dropped offline, so he's got nothing over here, so this is his most recent one. And Evan created two blocks, and that's his more recent one. So what we do first is we only look at the most recent blocks from each individual validator, which <coughs> basically means this, 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 this. And we run through the exact same process, but only using those five blocks to count toward the weight, right? So over here, you start from the root. One child, go over here. Then over here, this side, you have a score of one. On this side, you have a score of one, two, three, four. You go over here. Then you go here, and then score of one, score of one, score of two. Go here and here, and that's the head. Now, 
For now, we're assuming a simple kind of model where what I call blocks and what I call messages are the same thing, right? And basically, so in this case, uh, blocks are serving a kind of dual purpose. One of them is that blocks are kind of entries in this graph structure and like your fork choice is walking along the blocks. But the other role that blocks have is blocks are voting. Now, in LMD Ghost as we use it, blocks and messages will be split. And I'll get into this and why we do this later. So as in Ghost, start from the genesis, walk up the tree, at each branch choose the child that has more latest, message, latest messages supporting it, and keep going until you find the head. So why LMD Ghost, right? B the, so this is, uh, here we're intri bringing back kind of LMD Ghost as more like it actually exists in Ethereum 2.0. And what we have here is we have blocks and votes, um, aka attestations, as kind of two separate concepts, right? So you have a block, and then you have five votes, you have a block, or like in reality, this might be, could be anywhere up, up, up to about 50,000 votes. Then you have a block, you have a huge pile of votes, a block, a huge pile of votes. Now over here, you might have two different competing blocks, and this could be because one of the blocks just got delayed and the other block, and then the next proposer created a block and this block appeared. This could be because the proposer was malicious and created two competing blocks, we don't know. Um, so now, everyone who is voting chooses either this side or this side, and if they choose this side, then this block wins, um, and then you keep on going, right? So, the ghost fork choice rule is, is going to be counting these, right, the attestations. And specifically, it counts latest attestations. So if this, like, if this is all inside of one epoch, then there's no difference because everyone only votes once per epoch. But if you imagine that, say, this and this are two separate epochs, then maybe this attestation and this attestation come from the same validator, in which case you don't count this one, but you count this one. Now, in general, if a chain is progressing, then the, uh, if you vote once over here, then the next vote that you make is going to be a descendant of this block, right? So most of the time, validators aren't changing their opinion, they're extending their opinion. So if you made a, uh, an attestation supporting this block, then you're saying, my opinion is this block is the best. If you then later make an attestation over here saying, my opinion, this block is the best, then like you're not disagreeing with your opinion before, right? Your, an opinion that this block is the best is also an opinion that this block is the best and that this block is the best and that this block is the best. But before, you did not have an opinion on these guys and now you do have an opinion on these guys. But maybe you made an attestation here, then you make this attestation, then you realize this chain wins and so at some, po uh, late, uh, at some point later you do change your mind. So like both of these things are possible. Now, the reason why we do this is because this allows basically parallel confirmations, right? So in a kind of probabilistic fork choice rule, there is this general concept of confirmations, like basically how many kind of units of information in favor of a block are there, um, and how many do you want to wait for to achieve a certain degree of safety. In Bitcoin, you would wait for six, um, and, and that means waiting for six blocks. In Ethereum, like you would wait for 12, so you would wait for 12 blocks. But here, you basically get like tens of thousands of attestations happening in parallel. And so you get a very high assurance that a block is like overwhelmingly likely to be included in the chain, pretty much like in the average case after one single slot. So the goal here basically is to give the same level of security after 10 seconds that a uh, traditional proof of work chain would only give after minutes or hours. And because you have messages happening in parallel, there's no way that all of them are, like you can even possibly make all of them form a chain if you try, and so a longest chain rule is not even sensible, and LMD ghost kind of is the obvious approach for how to uh, take into account the information from all of these validators. Um, so why LMD ghost, right? So one reason is that the longest, like longest chain rules cannot take into account information from parallel attesters and ghost-based rules that do. Um, another interesting property that LMD ghost has is it has a property that the minority can never beat the majority regardless of how many messages they sign, right? So for example, suppose that you have like a, st a structure that looks like this and then 
base, so you have these four validators that are all on this chain, and these four validators kind of all agree that this chain is best, um, and you have this one kind of lone attacker. Now, let's suppose that AC, D, and E just get knocked offline, they disappear. Then, if you use traditional ghost, right, eventually B could just make blocks, B could make blocks, B could make blocks, and eventually B would, uh, B's chain would be longer and B would win. But in LMD ghost, if all, all four of these guys get knocked offline, then B could keep on making blocks, and B could keep on making blocks for a long time, but this chain is still going to continue to be the winning chain because it's not about the quantity of messages, it's about the quantity of distinct supporters of, uh, of one chain versus the other. And if these four validators don't make any new messages, then the system assumes that they're just supporting these four things forever. So this kind of insight, this idea that unlike longest chain rules, LMD Ghost has this mechanism where if it gets into this configuration, that you just can't like move over to this chain pretty much like no matter how long B tries. This is actually the basis of uh, CBC Casper, which is something that we're interested in uh, sw uh, switching to for the longer term. Um, but so this is one reason why LMD, uh, and a second reason why LMD Ghost is interesting. Now, let's look at some edge cases of LMD Ghost and specifically LMD Ghost's interaction with the uh, f uh, with the finality gadget, right? So saved message attacks are one uh, one uh, uh, a kind of I um, example of an edge case first, right? So basically. Here, look, the, here's the intuition behind the saved message attack. So a validator is allowed to make a maximum of one attestation in each epoch, and the way you enforce that is that every attestation has to come with a tag that says this is the epoch I come from, and if you send two distinct attestations with the same epoch tag, then you can get slashed for it. Now, a thing that you can do is you can say, well, I'm gonna just drop off a line for n epochs, and now I have n ta historical tags that I've unused, and then within one epoch, I can just like send all of those messages with all of those tags all at once. So, a worst case, uh, traditional ghost like is not very uh, is not very good at handling this kind of situation. Um, LMD ghost is better because at least those n votes do not stack on top of each other. But LMD ghost is still imperfect because with this kind of mechanism, well, you have the ability to kind of influence, the, basically make the fork choice go back and forth, right? You can say, I vote for you, now I vote for you, now I vote for you, now I vote for you. And you can repeat this a bunch of times in a single epoch, and this could be used for some attacks to, del to delay liveness and delay finality. So a proposed solution here is um, FMD ghost, which basically says clients only look at messages kind of tagged with the current or previous epoch, and this prevents kind of saving uh, saving up more than one more than two epochs from being uh, being useful for any kind of attack. Um, interaction between LMD Ghost and FFG. So we use both LMD Ghost and the FFG um, in this kind of combined way. Basically, LMD Ghost provides block by block consensus, and FFG provides uh, finality. And like you do have to kind of glue these algorithms together, right? So our actual uh, fork choice rule basically says, first, select the last finalized block you were aware of. And at the beginning, this is the genesis. Eventually, you become aware of new finalized blocks. Second, you select the highest, uh, highest epoch, the most recent justified block that's a descendant of the last finalized block. And then third, starting from the last justified block, you run LMD ghost to find the head. So it's basically running FFG first to figure out the, the last justified block and then running LMD, uh, LMD ghost from there to find what the head is. Now, this does open room for certain kinds of like bounce attacks. So basically the issue here is that you might have a situation where you have one block on one side and you have a block that's winning the fork choice rule, but then you have some block over here with 65% of the votes and then the attacker has a few votes, and then the attacker waits until some block here gets a 65%, and then the attacker releases a few votes here, this block becomes justified, and so suddenly the fork choice rule kind of flips over from here to here, and then people build over here, 
and then when this block starts getting close to a bit to 65%, then this block's at 65%, the attacker releases another 5%, now this is justified, now this halts, everyone moves over here, and so you can kind of bounce the chain around, right? And there's um, a couple of uh, kind of solutions that are um, um, intended to mitigate this kind of attack. Um, one of them has to, basically they all have to do with kind of delaying when um, new justified epochs have an effect, right? So one of them would say in most, like, uh, in most cases delay, until a sw uh, delay switching until an epoch boundary. Uh, so either finalization happens close to the start of an epoch or it happens much late or, or you wait until the end. Or an, another idea is that a um, checkpoint can only be used uh, can only be used to um, as part of the fork choice until like basically the the height since the last justified epoch multiplies by three, and this ensures that there's kind of periods of three epochs eventually within which the fork choice is not going to change, and you have the opportunity to finalize something. So that like. LMT ghost like, is not really more, complica more complicated than this, right? It basically is you have a block, and if that block has multiple children, to figure out whether you go to one child or the other child, you choose the child that has the most validators that kind of most recently supported that block, and you can use that by itself as a, um, as a fork choice rule, and you have a bunch of validators that are making these messages in parallel, and each of those messages contributes to the fork choice rule, allowing the chain to kind of soft converge very quickly. And after those messages are also simultaneously votes in FFG, and so after about one epoch, uh, the block uh, gets justified, and then the uh, uh, which kind of entrenches it in the fork choice further, and then after one more epoch, it, get, it, it gets finalized. Hi, uh, I'm Dankart Feist, and uh, I'm going to talk about randomness in um, Ethereum 2.0. Oh, how do I? Is there a? Huh? Oh, okay. Okay. Um, so basically, um, I quickly want to summarize why randomness is such an important problem um, in ETH, in any kind of proof of stake protocol and uh, ETH 2.0. Um, I'm going to talk about Rundow, which is our first and like rudinary source of uh, randomness. Um, quickly, like also go into the the issues that this has and why, like in the final protocol in a few years, we're going to use uh, verifiable delay functions to improve this uh, source of randomness. Um, so, why is it so important to have a good source of randomness and proof of stake? Um, well, so we need to do several things um, randomly, and uh, we don't have this kind of proof-of-work randomness that we have in proof-of-work chains anymore. Um, so we need to select proposers. We need to select uh, committees, um, and uh, we need um, also, like, as an extension, like some uh, contracts on chain want to use randomness, and we need to provide randomness for these as well. And so uh, for each of these, like... Um, like good randomness required for proposers um, because uh, we, we need to be fair, like we distribute rewards to them and also um, we, we want to protect against um, denial of service attacks. Um, but um, it's especially important um, for, the, for the committees that attest um, to the shard chains um, because if, like, if the committees are not honest, like the the beacon chain cannot cannot check the state transitions of all the shard chains because that's the whole point of sharding that you don't have this huge load on the beacon chain. Um, but that means we cannot have to trust these committees to be honest. Um, and um, we can remedy against an incorrect vote by a committee using fraud proofs, but we don't want to have too many of these. Um, and finally. Um, uh, we also want that smart contracts can use uh, randomness and um, yeah, some applications like lotteries or so might attach a huge value to random numbers and like if you can somehow attack them that might degrade the randomness in the 
your whole system. Um, right, and then a bit further on the committees, um, why why it is so important? This is like a very central issue there. Like um, if the um, the problem is that uh, you, we want to minimize the probability for having a, a dishonest committee. Um, and like um, a bad committee could potentially create uh, a link to an invalid or non-existent block. Um, and a, f a fraud proof would mean that you have to revert the state of the beacon chain until like when that happened. Uh, so like the probability if you have a committee size of uh, 128, then it's quite small, five times 10 to the minus 15. Um, but this kind of can of course completely change as soon as uh, someone can bias the randomness that we're using. Right, so the idea behind Randau is let's say like we have um, n people who want to generate a random number. Everyone goes into a room. Everyone contributes one random value xi. You compute the x of all these values, right? So that sounds like it could get generate good randomness. But the problem with it is the last player can just change their value um, after they have seen everyone else's value and then uh, they change their choice and like get whatever they want. Okay, so let's improve this. Um, so um, uh, with commit reveal, we can start the same. They all go into a room um, and they each commit to their value xi by uh, telling everyone the hash and then they reveal their value, we compute x or of those values again. Okay, so in this case, this cannot be manipulated because we force everyone uh, to reveal their value because they're all in the same room. Um, but um, in the real world, the problem is anyone can stop this process by not, um, not actually revealing their pre-image and then we can't compute this x or, right. So uh, Randau basically builds um, on this idea um, so we make every everyone um, who is a validator has already committed um, to something. In our case, it's actually their signature because we have a deterministic signature uh, scheme, uh, BLS. Um, we can just use a signature as a, as a reveal. Everyone can check that this was the correct signature. So you sign the epoch, this, this denoted by E here, and uh, that's that's the reveals. And then um, what can of course happen is that someone does not um, uh, produce a block and so they, they haven't revealed their randomness and then um, we cannot include them um, in this uh, XOR. Yeah. Okay, so that is the basic process of run now um, and, and this is used at a, as a first instance to generate randomness, um, ETH 2.0. Um, it uh, only has one problem basically that um, whoever is last in an epoch um, can just choose to not produce a block. Um, so basically what this, what this means is um, if I don't like the result of whatever this reveal that I'm going to contribute is, like I can compute whatever the mix would be, um, then I just don't contribute and it's as if I would get another roll of dice essentially. Um, and like you can, that can be worse if um, if you control several validators in a row, of course, then more bias is possible. Uh, so like there was um, one uh, nice analysis by Vitalik um, on ETH research where he showed that if you just have a longest chain fork choice rule, then uh, with just 36% of the stake, you can actually uh, completely take over a chain that's ba that chooses their blocks based on rundown, their block producers. Right, so, um, what run now is sort of our first uh, source of randomness in the beginning. It's obviously, as I've shown, not uh, perfect, but um, uh, at the moment we don't have anything better. Um, so like in the future, what we're going to build is on a like, so-called verifiable delay function. The idea is that um, you have a function, um, uh, f of x, that produces a result y and a proof pi. Um, such that this computing this function takes a long serial time, right? So you can't speed it up by having many processors. It's like you have to run it serially on one processor. Um, and then checking the result that uh, this result y is correct 
um, using the proof pi is fast. And so one example, which is actually the one that we'll, we are very likely going to end up using, um, is uh, this uh, squaring modulo and RSA modulo, so power uh, taking many squares of x modulo uh, m, where m is p times q, um, is like one way to construct such a uh, verifiable delay function. And uh, by using the VDF output on Randau, um, uh, VDF, sorry, the VDF on Randau, so using the Randau rather as input for the VDF, um, the last revealer loses the advantage, and the way that works can be illustrated here. So basically what happens is you have this last block of an epoch that starts the VDF computation. Um, and um, so later the VDF computation will have an output and um, that will be used uh, as randomness on chain, uh, but by that time there will already ha be many more blocks, so it, um, the uh, the, the last revealer wouldn't have a chance to know what, um, how they could have influenced by not, not revealing their uh, reveal. Yeah, that's it. Thank you. Hi. Uh, so my next talk is uh, BLS signature and aggregation. Uh, so the goal is to um, provide a minimal set of knowledge that uh, uh, that uh, make developers' lives uh, easier. So um, the goal is to introduce the signature scheme on the top, but uh, that uh, it is built on the uh, pairing operations and curve points groups and. Uh, they all build on the uh, uh, fields operations uh, uh, under button. So, uh, yeah. So, a takeaway uh, here is that uh, when we say BLS, we, we might uh, talk about two things. Uh, the one is the BLS signature aggregation scheme, and uh, the other is the curve. Uh, Parameter that uh, uh, chosen by uh, Zcash is called BLS twelve three eighty one curve. Uh, there are different authors. So first, I'll give a, a primer how uh, FQ operation works. Um, so uh, um, you have a, a field number like uh, field thirteen. That means uh, it it is uh, operates on, o operate on the uh, prime, prime number 13. And then um, you can define uh, addition, subtraction, multiplication, and division here uh, uh, with this number. And uh, note that the outputs uh, are always uh, between 0 and uh, uh, Q minus 1. So uh, you have uh, uh, no matter how, how complex uh, computation you, you've done on uh, FQ, you always um, get the same data size. And you can use the uh, PYECC library to, um, uh, to try, try on uh, different uh, prime number fields. And uh, here's another primer on uh, elliptic curves. You, uh, when we say elliptic curves, it's, a, uh, it's an equation in uh, this form. Um, it's, uh, it's a y square and x cubic. Um, when you define it on a real number, and when the x, y is a real number, you see a, a cur curved shape. But if you define it on a finite field, uh, it, it looks like scattered. Um, so a point on a curve is, um, has a, a x and y coordinates. Um, uh, usually you need to send the points uh, over the network. Uh, so, so you can compress it by only specify x and uh, only one bit to infer uh, which y um, you are talking about because uh, given x, the y is uh, symmetric. It's, it's only uh, two points on, uh, on the graph. So, um, and you can, you can uh, add a point to another point. So uh, we, you can define additions uh, uh, of the points on the curve. And it, it is uh, usually a line. Uh, when you want to add p to q, you uh, you draw a straight line, and 
intercept the curve on another point and then mirrored it down to find a P plus Q. So uh, when we have the addition of um, the point, you can uh, define multiplication for a point. Um, you can multiply a point like by 10 times, like by adding it 10 times. And uh, this, is, uh, this is a, a hard math problem that you can, uh, given you have a P and Q, and you cannot find a 10 uh, easy. It's really hard, so you can hide bodies in here. Uh, <laughs> uh, it's actually a secret key, yeah. And so uh, here, it, uh, let's talk about the uh, uh, BLS uh, 12381 uh, specification. So um, it has a small, small point uh, called G1 and a big point called G2. Um, if you remember the first uh, pyramid, is, uh, they have different uh, finite, uh, prime fields uh, on the button. Um, the small, uh, small, small point has uh, 48 bytes, and the larger one has uh, 96 bytes. Um, they have different uh, elliptic curve uh, um, defined, and uh, note that uh, um, um, so the, the FQ2 is uh, like a complex number. So it's uh, double the size of the uh, small curve. And there's an ima ima uh, imaginary uh, number i there. And the G1 and G2 is the generator points that, uh, uh, that has a, a specific x and y coordinates uh, specified uh, for, the, uh, for, for the curve. Um so uh, I'm uh, color coded uh, them so it, um, uh, don't uh, don't get lost uh, with G1 and G2. Um, so the pairing function, pairing function is a function that uh, takes a, a G1 group and G2 group. Um, um, the magic of the uh, pairing function is that um, when you like uh, multiply a constant a or b to the uh, group elements, and you can take the a b to the shoulders, and that means that you can take the a b into uh, the, the, the first one and the second one, and that's uh, rule number one. And rule number two is that when you are adding points, um, like you, you are adding points in G1, adding points in G2. You can like distribute them uh, and spread them out. So uh, with this construction, we can uh, introduce how we can, uh, uh, how the signature scheme is built on uh, this um, uh, type of construction. And, and if you look at the uh, pairing function, uh, there is some money over there because it's expensive to run. Um, uh, so uh, it's a it, uh, it's a computational heavily uh, function. It's um, so we we try to minimize um, the times you you try to uh, run pairings. So here uh, here's the uh, BLS, BLS uh, signature scheme. Uh, the private key is an integer. I uh, think it like uh, one two three or five. And uh, to get a public key, you just multiply the private key with the uh, G1 uh, point. And then to sign a message, you need to uh, hash the uh, message to a group of point. And that's the, um, when you uh, heard people saying the BLS standardization effort, they are standardized the way we hash the message to the group two point. And then you, uh, you, you multiply your pri private key to um, uh, the message, and you get a signature here. And to verify um, the signature and a uh, public key and a message, you uh, use two pairing functions. And the proof is really simple. It's like you write a G1 and S on the left hand side, and then uh, the, you can move the K from the right to the left, and you get the expression of the right hand side. Um, so the most powerful um, thing about BI signature scene is it can um, aggregate signatures and public keys. So uh, this just a, a curve point additions uh, which we introduced before. 
And this is, uh, you can add, aggregate three uh, signatures, and you, you can aggregate uh, as many signatures as uh, you want, and then verify using two uh, pairing functions to verify. So, yeah, so uh, the proof uh, leave as a uh, exercise. But what we are looking, um, so what you are looking at here, you are looking at a uh, scalability. So uh, this, um, this, uh, this is um, how you can um, aggregate uh, many uh, validator messages. So uh, here I, I present an example uh, that's uh, kindly borrowed from the uh, uh, simple theorize.com. So it is a, a, a attestation message, and it has uh, signatures. It looks like this. And then uh, I, um, I uh, hide the data part, and you'll see an aggregation bit uh, looks like this. And this is actually a, um, a, a record that says uh, a validator 5 uh, is your signature included in this uh, bunch of aggregation. And then a client will use that information to look up public keys and to verify these signatures. So yeah, that's uh, how uh, BLS signatures works. Uh, hopefully, uh, hopefully that helps you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Vitalik, Dunkrid, Chicheng. Um, next up was a break, but we don't have time for that because we're definitely, <laughs> definitely running late already. Um, we might have some time for questions at the end, but we're just going to keep driving. Uh, next up, Shao is going to talk about. We're we're moving into these are the kind of some of the building blocks to help you understand some of the underlying concepts that we use to construct these things. And now we're going to move into the like more concrete instantiation of the protocol. Shao Wei. So hello everyone. I'm sorry, I'm pretty sick right now. And konnichiwa. So my topic is the life of the. And Ethereum beacon chain uh, validator. So this is the outline of this topic. So we will talk about the two main factors to define the validator state. And then we will talk about the entry and exit queues, and then the life cycle of this. Uh, okay. So the current uh, spec defined uh, list four status. There are the, um, the activation eligibility, which is the preparing stage before it actually be activated. And then uh, the second one is the, the state that the validator is alive, active, and is help to uh, validate the state, the, the blockchain. And then when the validator, they can choose to uh, exit, then after a while, they will get into the exit status. And finally, the beacon chain validator will get into the withdrawable state. So uh, here we need to know is that the, in the beacon chain phase zero, we only have withdrawable state. There's um, the actually withdrawn state will be introduced in the phase two, where we have EEs, the execution environments. And that's when the validator can actually um, withdraw their deposit to the EE, to the shard chains. Okay. So uh, here is the validator's uh, data structure from the beacon chain state. So uh, the validator is uh, it has this uh, information we need to know. It's inside the beacon chain state. So here I highlight is the uh, the status epochs. So you can see this four um, different status epochs are defined here. And initially, the um, the state epoch is set into the uh, the unsigned integer uh, of uh, 64 bits, which is the maximum number of here. So the reason is that um, we can uh, we haven't defined this 
status. Uh, we haven't defined when this status will be happened. So we said a very long, very long uh, epoch. Okay. So um, Stanley explained it that we defined the slot and epoch. So each epoch uh, consists of 64 slots, and each slot is six seconds. So we can use this epoch number as the timestamp here. So as we define that, um, we can see the epoch as a timeline. And if the validator has been set to uh, with activation eligibility epoch 100, and also the activation epoch 200, then when the time actually um, between two of these two uh, epoch, uh, for example, uh, 150, the validator is not activated yet. And, <coughs> sorry, <coughs> when after 200 epochs, the validator will be actually activated. Oh, activate. Okay, and <coughs> so we introduced the uh, state epochs. Now there's another flag. Uh, it's oh. <laughs> another factor that um, affect the the beacon chains validator state, which is called the uh, slashed which I think Danny will talk about how the validator actually be slashed in the later uh, session. So in here, you only need to know is that a slashed validator will be forced to exit it, which is very reasonable because they might do something bad, behaved, misbehaved, so they will be forced to exit to be, yeah. Okay, then now going to talk about the um, the red limiting cues. Um, before that, I want to introduce the weak subjectivity. Uh, this uh, is a feature of the proof of stake blockchain, and so if if you are a, a new validators regarding online, and you you can only uh, join. You can only trust the your uh, peers that around you. And also, if you get offline and then be back again, you can you uh, you in the same situations that you can only trust your neighborhood. So um, then, how long you can be with be offline? It's introduced. Um, it depends on how long. The, it takes for the attacker to withdraw their stake. Then, <clears throat> then that's why the um, exit, I mean the exit rate is important here. And also the time line, the, the time period we set for an validator from the time it initiate uh, exit um, operation to it actually be exited. That period is also important. So um, in the beacon chain, we have two queues, which is one is the entry queue and another one is the exit queue. So um, these two queues are, uh, the reason why we use queue is that um, we need the network, also the, either the network and also the validator set to be as stable as it can be. So we, uh, we won't allow that in the short, short period, a lot of the validator got, they initiate exit, then the validator state will be like, you can't uh, select enough, uh, enough and the same state from the validator state. And also, <clears throat> it ensure that the finality guarantees is still remain between the to chance <clears throat> as long as the validator locks on oft, uh, often enough. So uh, we will see the, how the queue is happening. So, um, so this is the uh, churn rate functions. We, 
you can see that um, the for each epoch, the maximum number of uh, validator can join or to exceed it define um, it's based on the current active validator count. So uh, you can see that it, the number is set as this and the trunk rate uh, quotient is set to like 65,000. So uh, as you can see the number, you can estimate that how many validators can be set at the same time. And the life cycle. So at the beginning, the beginning, the uh, the validator, they will make a deposit on the East one chain, and East one chain is the endpoint uh, get to get let you get from the East one chain to East two world. So when the validator uh, they make a deposit of the thirty two ether to this uh, deposit contract. You also uh, watch the deposit contract status from the beacon chain. So um, so this is a diagram here, and we will show the full diagram later. Uh, so at the beginning, the deposit validator is here. And uh, we will check online and on the beacon chain logic that uh, is the validator has enough balance and ready to activate. And after four epochs, and also it's a first in first of a queue, we define the uh, the trunk rate uh, earlier, like in that function. So only the uh, small amount of the validator can join the validator state. This is the entry queue here. Okay, and then um, we s <coughs> sorry. Now let's take a look at the button uh, diagram. So from the when the uh, the validator is activated, and there's two possible um, in this road is uh, maybe the validator doesn't he got penalized and times by times and. The, the validator balance is insufficient. So that in that time, the validator will be ejected. And another uh, option is that the, uh, the validator can uh, volunteer, voluntary um, exit. This is the second road. So uh, both roads will get into, uh, uh, will push the validator in the exit queue here. So it's also, um, it has to wait for at least four epochs, and also it has to be enough room for this validator to exit. And then we call that um, this validator is in the state of, it's unslashed, but at, um, it's exited. <coughs> okay, so, and then um, after, 27 hours, it will be uh, withdrawable. The reason why we uh, remain, uh, we set a delay time between the exited and the withdrawable, there are uh, three most reasons. One is that um, the validator, after the uh, it's exited, it's still possible that it will got uh, slashed, which is the this route. And also, um, maybe the validator still have chance to get some a small amount of reward um, before it actually exit. And also, it will uh, provide the proof of custody challenge time to be made during this period. It, oh, I'm sorry, the proof of custody thing is the phase one thing that we will prepare this. And then <clears throat> let's take a look at the top diagram. So um, the activated validator might got slashed. And after it got slashed, it will wait a short 
delay until they with can can uh, initiate a withdrawal operation, and then uh, it got uh, into that uh, the slash and exited status. And after uh, at least thirty six days, it will be withdrawable. So it's a very um, you can see that the slash validator has to wait for more time. It's got punished because the, their ether is locked in the beacon chain. Yep. So that's the full picture that you can see how the validator uh, be switched between the status. Okay. Okay. No. Okay, the next one. Fake. Okay, so I'm going to talk about the um, state transition function uh, of the of the beacon chain, uh, and I encourage you to just um, you know read the specs. It's actually not too bad. It's only roughly a thousand lines of code. Uh, <laughs> uh, quite readable. I mean, the, the, the link up there is quite long, so I've also shortened it. Okay, just to give a bit of context, um, you know, you all know this. We have the beacon chain, which is kind of the, the system chain of the whole system, the spine. All the shards kind of connect to it via crosslinks. The shards come later, and I'm going to focus on the beacon chain. Okay, so we have slots, we know this. We have blocks in the beacon chain, and we also have state. And basically, state advances for every block. Um, and so what I'd like to focus on today is, you know, what is a block, what is state, and what is the state transition? Um, so this is the, the state transition function, and you know, it, it takes a state, a block, uh, returns a post state or an error. So it can just say, okay, this, this block is just invalid and I'm, I'm, I'm gonna abort there. And if it's valid, I'll give you the next version of the state. Uh, and ad in addition to slots, uh, we have epochs. So uh, 64 slots per epoch, which is 6.4 minutes. And epochs are, um, kind of important from the point of view of the state transition function because this is where some of the um, kind of accounting happens at the epoch boundary. So you have these state transition functions on a per block basis and then you have also state transition functions that happen on a per epoch basis. Okay, so this is a kind of a, a high level overview of the various components uh, of, of the beacon chain. and you can kind of think of it as an organism with various organs that connect to each other. So you might have you know, the lungs, the heart, whatever, all these things. And here they each provide kind of vital functions. So you have, for example, randomness. You have um, the, re the registry which keeps track of the validators. You have uh, finality down there. Uh, you need deposits, of course, if you want proof of stake. Um, and yeah, everything is kind of flat, so it's not like a, a layered system. Well, we, we do have like the beacon chain and, 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 and the, the shard data and the shard state, but within the beacon chain is actually quite flat and, and horizontal. And each of these things, you know, can be swapped out. It's very modular. And so, you know, one of the, the, the goal, the roles of a, of a designer is kind of to, to pick the best ingredients there and uh, try and, and put them together in a, in a harmonious system. Uh, and in terms of color coding, I'm gonna use um, blue for the state and, and green for the blocks. Okay, so what is the state? Let's try and, and actually read the code uh, chunk by chunk. So uh, try and understand w w what is in there. So we have these three properties. Um, which are basically related to, to versioning in space and time. So the, the, the genesis time tells you when, when the state was, was created. Um, slot kind of gives you a more granular um, notion of how much time has processed. 
and then the fork will kind of be versioning in, in, in space as it was as opposed to versioning in time. So every time we do a hard fork, we're gonna update this. And one of the, the impacts that has is on the, the way that signatures are, are, are verified. Okay, so that's all, all basic stuff. Um, more kind of um, basic infrastructure is um, you know, the, the notion of, uh, of roots. So we have uh, state roots and block roots, which is the equivalent to what, what is traditionally called a, a block hash or uh, an, an, an estate root. Um, and this is just uh, a way of uh, cryptographically keeping track of the various objects that we're working with and um, representing them in a way which is friendly to, uh, to work with. So the, the reason why we're working with roots as opposed to, to hashes is because the objects that we're working with are structured and we have this notion of a, of a tree uh, of hashes. Um, and so if you're interested in a very specific um, property of an object, then you can uh, access it via a, a, a Merkle path for just a specific object, as opposed to having to need the whole object. Um, and then we have um, kind of the, the economic uh, link to ETH1. So, uh, we need deposits into ETH2. The deposits come from ETH1, and so the ETH2 needs to be aware of ETH1. And, and this is the state that is going to help us um, be aware of ETH1. And then we have the registry. This is going to be um, like probably the most important part of the state. So it's just a, a, the data structure that keeps track of all the validators, and it's by far the largest part of the state. So you know, this might be hundreds of uh, hundreds of, of, of megabytes, let's say, and the rest might be tiny, just a, a few megabytes. We have um, some state related to shuffling and, and randomness. We have state related to slashings. Um, we have state related to uh, attestations. So attestations is basically what the validators need to do. That's the work that they have to do. It helps uh, advance the system and, and make it move forward. And this is what the, the validators get, get paid for. And we have the crosslinks, which is the, the link to the, to the various shards. And then finally, we have the finality mechanism. Um, and in terms of concretely, what, what are the, the, the modules that we've chosen? Here are some of the, 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 the keywords. So we have FFG for finality. We have uh, BLS signatures uh, for the attestations. Ghost for the folk choice rule. We have Randall for randomness. Uh, swap or not for the shuffling. We have SHA-256 as a hash function. And we have tree hashing as the way um, that we <coughs> Um, we uh, uh, Merkleize the um, um, the objects. Okay, so it all fits in the slide. This is this is the the, the, the state. Okay, um, so let's try and understand what's in a in, in a block. So in the block, we kind of have uh, the the header. This is the the header with things you'd expect, like the slot, which is the equivalent of the height in other systems, the parent root, which could be the parent hash in another system, state root, the signature, which is going to be the BLS signature, and then the body, which is going to be like the, mo the more important part um, of the block. Okay, so let's, let's look at the body, what's in there. So, um, you know, we have fields that are relevant to two of these um, uh, systems. One is the randomness system, making progress randall, and then the other one is related to the link to if one. So, trying to make that progress through through voting, and then we have a graffiti, which is just um, any any data. So this is kind of encouraging people to to innovate. Um, with putting data on the beacon chain. 
And then we have the equivalence of a, of, a, of a transaction. So normally, in a block, you'd put transactions. Here, it's a bit different because the transactions are not user transactions. They're system-level transactions. So we call them operations. And we have these five different operations. Two are related to, to slashing. One is the attestations, which is where like, the, the real work should happen. And then you have um, transactions which are related to people coming in of the system, leaving the system, or moving funds within, within the system. So these are just um, registry operations. The attestation is probably the, the most important. So block contains attestations, and that's what moves the system forward. OK, so I want to try and give you like the really high level of the state transition function. And I'm going to cheat a little bit. Um, and I'm going to only present what I call the honest state transition function. And by honest, I mean that I'm going to assume that the block has been honestly constructed. So it, it's a valid block. And, and what this means um, in practice is that I'm going to try and tell you what are the mutations that the block will make on the state. But what I'm not going to tell you about is all the various ways that, you, that the state transition function can, can throw an error. So all the various asser assertions. And it, it turns out that the bulk of the complexity is actually here. But here is really boring stuff. It's like, oh, verify that the signature is valid. Verify that if you're transferring funds, you have enough funds. <laughs> I think most of the insight actually you know, uh, comes here. Like, you know, just, just to try and understand how the state evolves. Um, this is where it all happens. OK, and so I've kind of subdivided the, the, the modules into, into three columns. So you have the, the, the scaffolding, which is relevant pretty much for all blockchains time, roots, and randomness. Um, and then you have the, the registry, which is, which is the un one unique part um, to proof of stake. So you, know, you have things like deposits and exits. And then you have uh, a, a final bit, which is you know, technically uh, you know, optional, but it's, it's, it's still extremely powerful related to uh, to finalization and crosslinks if you want sharding um, and and uh, also uh, ghost uh, through, through, through the attestations okay so let's go through these components one by one so blue is the state green is the the, the blocks so what happens at every every um, every slot? The slot the slot number will increment. So you you, you read the, the slot value and you just increment it. Nothing nothing uh, complicated here. And the the genesis time and the fork don't change. Um, I mean the fork will change kind of at the social consensus layer, but it doesn't change within the the, the state transition function. Then you have um, kind of the, the header part of the block in green, which gets uh, saved into, into a data structure and also um, gets um, merkelized into, into block roots. So the, the, the beacon chain is kind of aware of its, of its block roots um, in, in the past, the recent block roots, and also recent state roots. Um, and it will basically come build from these uh, so-called uh, historical roots. So this is um, a historical accumulator which allows you to go back in time arbitrarily far and provide a witness to any part of the state or any part of a block. And one of the cool properties of this accumulator is that the, the witnesses don't change over time. So if you have... Um, you know, a, a statement saying, I know that, you know, at slot 1000, the, the balance of this validator was 
this amount, well, whatever proof you had, the, the, the Merkle path will remain valid um, forever. And then you have the randomness, uh, which was explained by Dankhat. And, and, and this, is the basic, this is the basic scaffolding. And the, the way that the, the randomness moves forward is that in every, every block, the green part, you XOR in the reveal into the Randall mix. So the Randall mix just keep, keeps on mixing in entropy, and, and this entropy is kept in the state, and it's, it's sampled every epoch to do um, shuffling. Okay, then we have the, the registry with the validators. And one of the things that we've done here um, as an optimization is we've decoupled the, the, val the, the balances from, from the rest of, the, of the, um, the validator fields. And the reason is that the validator fields will change very infrequently, whereas the balances will change uh, very frequently. So there's a, there's a high um, overhead to constantly be uh, uh, mercurializing what, what changes fast. And so we want to segregate uh, in one place everything that changes fast. And this was covered by Xiaowei. Um, so in the <clears throat> Let's, let's have a, 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 a quick deep dive as to what, what's inside these validators. So the validators is a list of validator objects. This is what the um, validator object looks like. It has the, the public key, as you'd expect. This is kind of interesting. It's um, the hash of another public key. So this other public key is meant to be um, your with, withdrawal key that you keep in cold storage. So you, as a validator, you have two keys, you kind of have a hot one that you use on a, on a day-to-day basis to sign your attestations, and then you have a, a cold one which you use for withdrawals and transfers. And so if your validator node which is online gets hacked, then the hacker cannot steal your funds. Um, so that creates a, a nice level of protection for you. Okay, all, all of this was covered by, by Xiaowei. Okay, so which parts of the systems interact with the registry? Well, we have um, the deposits. So every block in the beacon chain will contain a list of deposits here. And these deposits will get processed. And then that will create validator entries in, in the registry. But then the beacon chain needs to know what is a valid deposit. And for that, it needs to be aware of the ETH1 chain. So how does that work? So in every block, we, the, the block proposer will have ETH1 data saying, you know, this, this is what I think is the block hash of, um, of ETH1 around which we need to come to consensus. And so this data gets stored in, in the state as, as votes, and then at, the, at, at a certain epoch boundary, these votes are counted, and if there is um, a majority of votes for a specific ETH1 data, this specific ETH1 data is updated in, in the state as, 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 as the, the latest um, uh, snapshot of, of ETH1. And the idea here basic, basically is um, honest majority sampling. So, we have, we have the, a large number of validators, let's say a million validators. We have this honesty assumption that at least two-thirds of the active um, validators are honest. We're going to sample a thousand of them. And, and the way that this, this sampling uh, works is over a, a thousand uh, sequential slots. And if, we, if this randomness is good enough, then we, we know with high probability that at least one half of the ETH1 voting committee will be honest. The voting committee being these 1,000 um, block proposers. And, and so that means that if we have at least uh, half of the votes here 
um, vote for a given piece of data, then that piece of data will be representative of reality, representative of, of if one. And, and by the way, this honest majority idea is really used for cross-links as well. Okay, so um, now I guess comes the, the more interesting uh, stuff. So the, uh, the attestations, this is the, the work that the validators have to do. So what is inside an attestation? So this is kind of the, the header of the attestation. Um, it has a signature. And here it's important that we have the BLS because we have um, different um, validators all part of the same committee that will be signing the same attestation. And the way that the aggregation works is that we're gonna specify in, in the aggregation bit here which validators have participated in a specific aggregation. So we have a committee, let's say of a thousand validators, they're ordered, and this bit list is gonna be a thousand bits, each zero or one, one indicating that the a validator was included in the aggregate signature here for this attestation. And then we have the data, which is gonna be the, the body of the attestation, which is more interesting. And it basically has three parts. The attestation data, when you make an attestation as a validator, you're making three votes all in one go. Um, and this is, is, is part of the reason why, this is part of what I mean by harmoniously connecting the various elements. Th th this is one, one place where we've done it. So when you, when you make an attestation, you, you're voting for um, a, a past um, beacon block and that's going to count towards um, the fork choice rule, LMD ghost. But at the same time, you're making a finality vote, an FFG vote. And so you're gonna be, vo you're gonna be voting for a source target pair. And so that's gonna lead to justifications and finality. And in addition, you're voting for a, a crosslink. So as a, as a committee, you're assigned to a specific shard. You're meant to download the, 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 a, piece, a chunk of the shard, run it, validate it, and if it's good, then make a crosslink. So vote, vote for that specific chunk of shard. So I mean, th th this this was covered by Danny. Basically, the 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 in the what what is a checkpoint here in the FFG vote is nothing more than a pair of an epoch and and a, and a hash. And what is a crosslink? Well, a crosslink is a, a, a small segment of a shard. So how do you represent that? Well, you need the shard number. You're going to need the start of the and the end epoch of this chunk of shard. Um, that you're cross-linking, and you, you're going to need the, the data route, which is going to represent, um, this is going to be the, the, the mercurialization of the chunk that you're cross-linking. Okay, so in green, we have the attestations in the blocks, and then on a slot-by-slot -slot basis, they get stored into the state, and they can either get stored in the, uh, as previous epoch or current epoch attestation. So if your attestation is stale, it's very old, it's older than the previous epoch, then we don't even bother um, saving it in state. We only uh, record the, the current and previous epoch attestations. And then, and then here we have the, 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 the beginnings of the finality uh, mechanism. So the finality mechanism works on an epoch by uh, epoch basis, uh, hence the, 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 the blue arrow. And what it does is that it is going to look at the, the cache of, of recent attestations and then count, count the votes. And if we, if we get to this uh, two-third threshold, is go, it, then we're going to uh, record that we have met the two-thirds threshold by modifying the, the ju justification bit um, and also by uh, potentially advancing the, 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 
the last and the, the, the previous uh, justified epoch. And then if we have this um, so-called finality patterns, of which we have four, as explained by Danny, then we're also going to advance the, the finalized checkpoint. So the, the, the beacon chain is going to be aware of its, its last finalized checkpoint. And as part, as part of this, you know, as part of the, the, the safety of this, this mechanism is the idea of, of slashing the attesters that, that make bad votes. So how does this work? Well, we have fraud proofs. We have proofs that uh, attesters have been doing a bad job. These are included in, in blocks in green. And they're going to have an immediate effect, a, a green arrow, on, on the registry. So if someone has, has done slashable behavior, they will be marked as slashed immediately on, um, in the registry. And in addition to that, we, we keep track of the total amount of, um, of ETH that, that, that was slashed. And the reason we do that is because um, we want to the, the, we, we want to have a mechanism whereby if only a few attesters um, do bad stuff, for example, then we, we, they're not really jeopardizing the system. So we don't want to penalize them too, too strongly. But if lots of people are doing bad stuff, then the system is at risk. And so we want to penalize everyone to, to a large extent. And so this, this variable here in the state in blue is, is keeping track of how much bad behavior has happened in the recent past. And then we have the crosslinks. And this, this works pretty much exactly, the, well, very similar to, um, mm, yeah, to, 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 to this. So, um, hmm. no, it doesn't work the same. Um, <laughs> Um, oh no, this, this is different, sorry. So this is basically is a, is a mapping from, um, from shard to, to, um, to crosslink, and it records the, um, either the, the, the previous crosslinks or the current crosslinks. And basically, on, on an epo every, every epoch, hence the blue arrow, we, rec we save the current um, crosslinks in the, in, in the previous crosslinks, um, and that basically allows for the, for the beacon chain to be aware of, uh, of recent crosslinks across all the shards, and hence for every shard to be aware through the beacon chain of the crosslinks on, on every other shard. And uh, yeah, this, this, is, this is pretty much it. So we have the, the full kind of honest state transition function um, uh, at a high level. Again, like made out of these modules which are replaceable, which talk to each other. And at the end of the day, there isn't that much happening. There's basic scaffolding. There's you know, maintenance of the registry, which is kind of obvious stuff. And then there's uh, finality, which is a very important gadget. And then we have this cross-linking gadget um, for sharding. OK, great. So that's what we're looking to launch in phase zero, but what, what comes afterwards? We, um, we have uh, transfers, which are um, slated to come um, likely in, in phase one, which will basically allow for uh, ETH on the beacon chain to be uh, sellable, and that will create a, a market uh, for, for this ETH. But we also have a bunch of security upgrades that we're looking to do. And each of these security upgrades are optional, but they're very nice to have. And you know, one of the reasons why we're not putting them up front is because they, they, they all have uh, you know, f fancy constructions and fancy cryptography. So one, one of them is uh, custody proofs, which we're looking to do in phase one. We have the idea of secret proposers, where instead of um, knowing up front um, who, the, who the next proposers will be, um, we can have a system whereby we don't know which proposers will be invited to create beacon blocks, and that is 
a, a way to protect ourselves against denial of service attacks. Because if you know who the next proposers will be, then you can target them um, at, the, at, the, at the networking layer. We have a VDF um, randomness upgrade, um, which you know, might come in phase two, might come later. And then we have um, data availability proofs. And I mean, one thing I didn't mention here actually is um, uh, light clients uh, in infrastructure. So we want to make it very easy for, um, for to have um, a beacon chain light clients and, and this infrastructure will come in phase one. And we also have um, a CBC ghost, which I, I a CBC Casper, which I haven't listed here. And then kind of two, two other ways in which uh, we, we, we we, we may upgrade the, the, the beacon chain is to, um, to have multi-hashing. So instead of having uh, one single hash function, SHA-256, we might uh, add native support for another hash function, uh, one which could be friendly to snarks and to stocks. Um, and you know, later down the line, we're also looking to change the various cryptographic primitives, which are not quantum secure, um, and change them over to quantum secure equivalents. And so this includes BLS12381, which is not quantum secure, and also the RSA-based uh, VDF, which is not quantum secure. So I guess that will keep us busy for a few years. Um, and yeah, that's it. Thanks. Thank you, Justin. Um, I'm going to close it out talking about the validator duties in, um, or as uh, Age says, duties. I'm just joking. Uh, <laughs> I'm talking about the validator duties in phase zero. Some of this, if you actually look at the phase zero state transition spec, the um, validity conditions that Justin didn't go into kind of imply what a validator should be doing. But uh, to make that explicit, we have the separate doc. And when I was compiling my slides, I thought that was a good idea. So I made a uh, QR code and a tiny URL. Um, so this document, which I'll go over some of the, the core components of it, uh, explain what and when a validator should be doing uh, with respect to the beacon chain. The initial part of this document talks about um, creating public keys, initiating deposits, um, and a lot of that uh, was kind of covered in Shaoways and uh, just will be out of scope for this portion. Um, so you, the two, jeez. <laughs> The two main things that you do in phase zero is you propose blocks and you attest to blocks. Um, in uh, subsequent phases, you would do similar activity, but also on um, shard chains. Um, so we have some stuff going on pretty much at any given slot. You can say, am I the proposer? And if you are, make a block. Um, this can be, uh, this is independent of, of your attestation committee, your cross-link committee assignment, and it's noble within the epoch of, um, of assignment. You, you don't have a look ahead in a prior epoch, which is also different from the committee assignments. Um, and the action of proposing a block is, is at the, the initial start of a slot. So slot 10 starts, I make my block, I give it to the world. Um, and this is, uh, this is uh, your proposal is, is public in, publicly known, um, and so as uh, Justin talked about, secret leader election is something that we're looking into. Um, computing the proposer index is essentially taking all the validators, uh, shuffling them, and using some of, some of the recent randomness along with their effective balance to um, sample them. Um, Great, so you, the, the chance of you being selected is also proportional to your balance. Most, uh, most validators in normal operating conditions would have an effective balance, as we call, which is capped out at the max, which is capped out at 32. Um, so most, in many situations, uh, there'd be an, an equal, equivalent chance of being selected for a proposal. So Justin already talked about these data structures, the beacon block, the beacon block body. Uh, what I do is I reveal my Randall, which is a signature upon the epoch. Um, I go and find my ETH1 data, which I'll show you about in a second. I sign some graffiti. Maybe I'll uh, vote on some proposal or I'll uh, say things about 
uh, who I am, um, and I fill in any of these operations. Most importantly, I'm gathering up attestations because that's how I make my block proposal worth it and profitable. Um, by including high value attestations, which are attestations that have not yet been included, um, attestations that are highly aggregated, so it has a lot of participants in them, and attestations that are uh, more recent. Uh, by, by optimizing those things, I can optimize my reward. Um, I think you get one eighth of the reward that was given to attestations. For attestations, you receive yourself. Um, so. In general, by proposing, uh, by being a good proposer, over time you're increasing your reward by about one eighth. Um, deposits, deposits. Um, we come to consensus upon the ETH1 data, uh, which is some past ETH block, uh, and the deposit contract deposit route. And this deposit route allows us to process deposits in order um, of making a proof against that route a Merkle proof, um, and this number max deposits is, it, I have to, I have to, by the rules of the protocol, include deposits, any unprocessed deposits up into that max deposit. So I think that's, that number is 16. Um, so if there were 32 deposits that are unprocessed, I have to include 16. If there were two, I include the two and then no more. If there's zero, zero. Um, I also, voluntary exits might be flying around on the network. I can pick those up, put them in. I'm kind of naturally incentivized to put those in because the fewer validators that exist, I'm, uh, hmm, the function's a little bit dynamic, but uh, I get a little bit less uh, overhead and, and it's nice. Uh, proposer slashings and attester slashings. I might also choose to be, um, I might be policing the network looking for nefarious activity. Um, and if I find these things, submit proofs, proof of them, uh, I get a portion of the, I, I get a, a small reward, a small amount of what was slashed. Um, so we can look into a little bit more into this ETH1 data. Uh, essentially what this function does is like what I call a pile on vote. Like, once I see, we divide uh, the voting period, the ETH1 voting period, into a number of epochs. And if I see uh, good votes for ETH1 data, I just pick that vote and I, and I, and I vote on it. Um, some, of the, some of the mechanism in here is to prevent me piling onto votes that were, that were a little bit stale. So early on in the period, if it's less than the integer square root of the slots per ETH1 data period, I um, will not pile on my vote if it looks like someone was putting in some stale information, uh, but otherwise I just vote on what the majority is and is valid. Um, if there's no votes, I, the default, I go get my own ETH1 data. Um, and what, what we do in this, in this initial uh, release is that we follow the ETH1 chain by like a thousand blocks. Um, to be safe. This is not, the ETH1, the beacon chain cannot handle if there were a reorg past that, and the ETH1 chain knows nothing about the beacon chain. So this is an assumed uh, safe distance to follow the chain, and so you do have like an induced latency on handling deposits because of that. Um, I'm not certain what the most deep reorg is ever been in ETH1, but it's not even on the order of like 100. So assume to be safe unless there was an attack. If there was an attack, um, maybe we should revert the ETH1 chain instead of the beacon chain because it was attacked. Uh, but that's, we'll see. Um, cool. Slashability of block proposals. Um, it's really cheap to sign things, uh, so we have to make it and, but it's in, as opposed to improve work, it's it's very expensive to make blocks that look valid uh, because you have to exert the computational power. So if I've been chosen to um, make a block, uh, I need to the protocol needs to make that expensive so that I can't make a ton of them. Uh, so essentially, we have a very simple slashing addition um, that is making sure that I'm not making two of the same block in the epoch. Actually, in a soon to be released version, that's changed to me not making the same. Um, block in the same slot. Uh, but essentially it's like a no double vote, uh, no double proposal mechanism. Uh, committees. So I don't know if we've explicitly talked too much about committees. We talked about like how we shuffle the people into committees, but essentially within 
a given epoch, every validator is assigned to exactly one slot to attest to it, uh, to create an attestation. That data structure that does all the things, it votes on uh, the head for the fork choice, it votes on a cast refugee vote, votes on a crosslink, it does all sorts of stuff. Um, <clears throat> so I can use this function uh, to essentially query which slot I'm assigned to, what shard I'm assigned to, and I can do my duty. Um, I get a look ahead of at least one epoch. So um, during the current epoch, I know my assignment in the next epoch. Uh, this allows me to um, sync whatever shard I need to and kind of like get ready for my duty. Uh, this is actually tunable uh, in min seed look ahead. If we, for some reason, needed a, uh, a longer look ahead because the overhead of syncing a shard or something was long, we could tune that constant. Um, it's a trade-off between a, kind of the longer you have, you know the committees, the easier it is, the easier it is to potentially DOS or uh, bribe or whatever. Um, so I make an attestation. Yeah, I had the cursor highlighted, so that's why it's green. Um, so I make this attestation. I do it at the slot, my, the, the slot I'm assigned to, that time, plus half of a slot duration. So the idea is under optimal conditions, a proposer has created a block at the start of a slot, and by halfway through the slot, I've gotten that block, I see that as the state of the world, I vote on it. Um, in certain non-optimal conditions, I might vote on some prior block, uh, but I can still kind of add weight, as Vitalik showed in, in Fork Choice, and I can still uh, manage to begin, still keep the chain moving forward and finalize things. Um, I run my fork choice, and I get, uh, <clears throat> I see where uh, the head of the chain is. The state relative to that head of the chain at the slot that I'm assigned to um, is also going to give me uh, this information. So I can actually just go into the state and say, hey, what was the checkpoint? Like, what are we voting on right now? Um, and just pull that information and construct this data. This uh, is actually just stubbed in phase zero, uh, but it, this is relative to me running the fork choice on the shard chain. Um, that's not super important. That's actually what I'm going to put into the crosslink, uh, which Justin pretty much covered. The fun part is that, because it's phase zero and there's no short chains. So just a zero hash. The custody bit. So this is, I, I just want to show you this data structure, because even though at phase zero, uh, we don't have a notion of, we don't have any shard chains, so we don't have this notion of custody games and having custody of shard data. Um, but there is this notion of like a bit um, and a custody bit, which is rel uh, tied to my personal, uh, a personal secret that I have and the attestation, uh, the, cus the cross link that I'm cross linking. And so I'm not actually signing just the attestation data. I sign the attestation data with my bit. A zero or a one. And so for any given com uh, committee in phase one, uh, we'd have two versions of this aggregatable signature, the one with the zero bit and the ones with the one bit. In phase zero, this is stubbed as a zero bit. Um, right, but in this outer data structure with the custody bits, so we remember, we remember who participated with the aggregation bits, and we remember which custody bit they participated with so that we can reconstruct uh, the, mess, the proper message to validate the signature in the future. In phase zero, uh, when I'm constructing my attestation to broadcast, I flip my bit, uh, my position in the shuffling of the committee, I flip that bit, and for the custody bits, that's all zero. And I broadcast that to the network at the halfway point of the slide. Um, Let's see. There are some uh, micro, called micro incentives related to the creation of an attestation. Uh, it's pretty much the various components of what I'm doing. Is the head correct? Correct being defined by what ends up being the canonical chain. Was the target of the FFG vote correct? Uh, was the source of the FFG vote correct? The crosslink. Um, so pretty much. Any of these things that end up being canonical, if I got the vote right, I get a good reward. And I also get rewarded for fast inclusion. Um, this is, uh, so the sooner the attestation gets included on chain, the more reward, and this portion of the world, reward degrades very quickly. And this is so that I don't, I'm not incentivized to like 
wait a little bit longer, see what everyone else is doing uh, before I actually cast my vote. I want to uh, move very quickly, get my vote in, and get maximum reward. Uh, this is handled in process rewards and penalties. Um, this is maybe not so surprisingly after our interop session. This is where we found the most uh, consensus bugs on our initial networks. Um, obviously, the calculations that deal with everyone's balances was where we had bugs. But been reading, writing some new tests and enhancing that, uh, getting it ready. Slashability of attestations. Uh, this these correspond to the uh, two slashing conditions found in Casper FFG. Pretty much. Um, if it's not the same vote, it can't, uh, I mean, if it's not the same vote, it can't be the same, the same epoch. Essentially, if you double signed in an epoch, you're slashed. Um, and you can't do this surround vote. So if we have uh, this attestation that has a source and target, we can't have an, a kind of a surrounding attestation that just like jumps over it. Oh, that's it. Cool, yeah. Um, Thank you. That was a long session. Appreciate you all being here. Um.